Hey everybody, Pierce Redman here for PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And if you're wondering where is the intro music and uh, why am I talking right now instead of just getting right to the episode, that is because I have a very special announcement to make. And that announcement is that I am launching my Patreon campaign. For anyone that doesn't know, uh, Patreon is a web-based service that provides uh, everybody from musicians to artists and, uh, in my case, podcasters, the opportunity to set up a subscription-based web service. So uh, you can now help uh, support the show by subscribing to it and uh, giving a small monthly donation. Now, I know some of you out there might be wondering, what about NewsBud and BoilingFrogsPost.com? Well, as some of you may have uh, already figured out or have known, I am no longer a part of either NewsBud or BoilingFrogsPost.com. And I don't want to get into all of the specifics, but um, I just no longer really saw eye to eye with where we were going in terms of NewsBud and, and uh, BFP. So I- I'm just no longer a part of it. I, you know, no ill wishes to anyone over there, uh, but I am no longer a part of it. So apologies for anyone that may have donated money to NewsBud uh, thinking that I was a part Part of it. And for anyone that didn't and does want to support me, then of course the best way to do that would be through Patreon. So this is very exciting for the podcast. Um, it is something that I know of. Uh, I've had other people tell me about uh, that I should do something like this. And I've mentioned now for at least a year that uh, I would be implementing something like this. But the time has come. So uh, by the time you're listening to this, of course, you can check out below in the show notes. There will be a link to my Patreon campaign. So basically, uh, again, for anyone that's uh, unaware of Patreon, for a small monthly donation, you can help support the podcast and all the various podcasts. So, of course, Porkins Policy Radio, the CIA and Hollywood and everything else that I do. A uh, quick note, uh, for Porkin's Great Game, we will actually be launching a separate Patreon for that, and that should be coming out uh, in about a week or so, and I'll, of course, have more updates um, about that. That will be set up a little bit different from this one, uh, whereby for Porkin's Great Game, we'll, we're going to be doing the donations on a per-show basis, but... If you want to help support the uh, the podcast that I've been doing uh, on Porkins Policy Radio, some of the, the great uh, stuff that we've been doing in terms of the O.J. Simpson trial, Jeffrey Epstein, if you like the CIA and Hollywood, and uh, the uh, first episode of that, or first couple episodes, should be out by the time you are listening to this, then I would really encourage everyone to go to Patreon and sign up. So it, uh, it, it won't be very much money at all. Uh, for a dollar a month, you will get a special on-air thank you, and you will also be listed in the video credits for the episode. And of course, if you want to remain anonymous, you, you can totally do that as well. For $3 a month, you will have a question answered on-air on a podcast. You will have a, also a special thank you on-air, and you will also be listed in the video credits. Now, for a small and modest fee of $5 a month, you will have everything I've just mentioned, including a question answered on air, a special on air thank you, and listed in the video credits. But you will also have access to the a special exclusive bonus podcast. And as a little treat for everybody, this uh, episode that or this interview that you are about to hear right now with Stephen Singular is just a taste of the special bonus podcast material. So uh, for the, the bonus podcast, it'll be a variety of things. Sometimes it will be an interview with a guest you may have uh, previously heard on the show. Sometimes it'll be a new guest. Uh, but sometimes it'll also just be me, um, you know, talking about... Uh, all sorts of different things. And uh, I'm thinking of making some of the uh, bonus podcasts a little bit more personal, uh, you know, getting to know me a little bit more, um, some behind the scenes thing about how I work and do the podcast and hopefully some video podcasts as well. And uh, of course, if you want to, you can always um, submit uh, questions and ideas that you want, and I can answer them on the exclusive bonus podcast. So this is a really great way to help support the show. I know I get a lot of people emailing me asking, you know, how can I, how can I donate? How can I help out? 
And this is really a fantastic way. And again, a dollar a month uh, would be, you know, uh, would put me over the moon. So don't feel obligated for the, you know, three or five dollar uh, a month fee. A dollar a month would be fantastic. Now, if you want to just make a one time donation, that is, of course, always welcomed. And uh, faithful listeners will have noticed that on the website right now, there is a PayPal donation button. It is at the top left hand side of the screen just underneath the search bar. So if you want to just give me a, you know, if you just want to send me a dollar once, if you want to send me a hundred dollars, you can go and do that, of course, through the PayPal donation. And again, um, I can uh, always... uh, uh, thank you on air. And I can also uh, give you some uh, access to the bonus podcast material. So I hope that all of you will come out and support me with this uh, Patreon campaign. Uh, as I said, we're going to have some more updates on the Porkins Great Game. And uh, for anybody that uh, skipped through this and just went straight to the interview with Stephen Singular, I will also be talking about the Patreon campaign at the end of this interview. So thank you all so much and enjoy the very first bonus bonus podcast. We are joined by uh, one of our good friends now and a regular on the show, Stephen Singular, of course, the author of Legacy of Deception. And Stephen has been on the podcast several times before. And uh, uh, Stephen, how are you? Good, good. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing great. And uh, I have to say the uh, comments section for our last podcast has become very lively. And we've had a, a lot of different people throwing out uh, theories and different points of evidence related to uh, Mark Furman and, and the timeline and when the blood was planted, how the glove got moved. So I'm really, uh, a, you know, appreciative of all of that. And of course, it, that wouldn't be possible without your book, Stephen. And Stephen is joining us because there is uh, a brand new edition of Legacy of Deception. And of course, the, the, the book, if you go to Amazon, is Legacy of Deception, an investigation of Mark Furman and racism in the LAPD. This is a Kindle edition, um, and so it's, it's very inexpensive, only $7.99, and it is an updated version. And so, Stephen, why don't you um, explain a little bit uh, how this is a, an updated version, what makes this different uh, from the, the book that you published back in the 90s? Well, a number of things happened after the book was published. Um, The book was done at the end of 1995 and came out in early 1996. And so that would have been about three or four months after the end of the trial. And so I wanted to go back through the manuscript and basically add some things that I felt sort of bolstered what, what I was saying in the book. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, Christopher Darden wrote a book that was a New York Times bestseller called In Contempt. It also came out in later in 1996, so I wasn't aware of it or I didn't know what he was doing when I brought out Legacy of Deception. He devotes in his book five full pages to the book proposal that I wrote in November of 1994, well before the trial started and laid out some of the physical evidence that backed up the notion that Furman had had planted evidence, but probably most importantly went to the issue of EDTA, which is this anticoagulant in blood. We've talked about it before, but for the audience, it's a little bit complicated. And it means that when a, a criminal defendant or a suspect uh, goes into the police station and has their blood drawn, Uh, The blood is taken out, it is put in a vial, usually with a purple cap on it, and that signifies that in that vial is a a substance, a chemical substance called EDTA, it has a long name, and that substance is there so the blood won't coagulate, so you can use the blood over a long period of time, and you can do DNA testing or anything else that you needed to do with that blood, it's a very important thing. So what everyone knows about the Simpson case is that the blood evidence was the critical part of it against him at his trial. I mean, if we stop and pull back and think about it a little bit, there were no witnesses to this crime. Mm -hmm. There is no murder weapon to this crime. The, The coroner who first testified about the crime said that, in fact, not one knife was, but two knives were used, implying that there were two assailants, not one. That throws the 
prosecution's case way out the window. So they got rid of that coroner and brought in somebody else who changed that story. And that's what he did in court. So the, the critical, critical evidence here was the blood evidence. And my involvement mostly was around getting someone to test the blood to see if the critical blood swatches would have that compound in them. Now, what that means is that if, if they did, then that blood could not have come out of O.J. Simpson's body on the night of the crime. Physically impossible. And that would mean that the blood evidence being looked at actually would have come out of that test tube, which implies, of course, that that, that blood evidence was planted. So in a case where everybody could speculate about every possible thing, this was a way to run a scientific test to actually prove one way or another if that was in the, in Simpson's blood. There was never any question from the beginning that the blood that came back from the lab was going to be Simpson's. The critical question, and this is for the listeners, what was in that blood? So I wrote a book proposal in late October of 94. Uh, the proposal was leaked against my wishes or intention. It went to the district attorney's office in Los Angeles. It went to uh, the defense team, and it went at least to the New York Times. It, it may have gone to, I think it probably went to the Los Angeles Times as well. So when Christopher Darden in the DA's office got his hands on it, he read what I just laid out here for you. And he and other people on the prosecution team said, well, that's totally preposterous. You know, how that blood wasn't planted. There's no EDTA in those swatches. So over a period of time, it took about three months, they decided to disprove this idea. And they brought in a lawyer named Rockney Harmon, prosecutor. And he wrote to the FBI, and he didn't write to the FBI and say, test the blood and let's see what's in there. Very important point. He wrote to the FBI and said, refute the notion mm -hmm. that something's in there. So here you have a government agency, a district attorney's office, communicating with another government agency, FBI. So you would think they would be sympathetic to one another. And the mission is to disprove the idea, not to, not to uncover the truth at all. So they brought in the FBI. They ran what's called a gas chromatography test, which looks for this EDTA. It separates it out. And lo and behold, guess what happened? The prosecutors could not call FBI Special Agent Roger March to the witness stand because in his testing, he found EDTA in the blood samples they were using. Again, in all of my talking with you, and it's all been very worthwhile, and I appreciate the opportunity to do it, People make this case about everything except evidence. It's about race. It's about media. It's about every other thing. But most criminal cases, including this one, are about evidence. That's the way our system is designed to work. And for the most part, that's how it works. So very few people understand that chain of circumstances that I just laid out. The FBI was called in with the specific purpose of refuting this notion of planted blood, and they couldn't refute it. And so the defense, when they started to put on their case, they actually called the FBI agent, Roger Martz, and under oath in a courtroom, he testified that he found something consistent with EDA in the blood. So the, the, I didn't know when my book was written that... Christopher Darden would write anything about me or the book proposal, but he goes through it. And, and there are several important points about that. Number one is that they were very, very aware of that proposal. They were very aware of what kind of defense Simpson's team was going to put on. Remember, this is November 1st of 1994. The trial starts at the end of January, 1995. They have three months three months to say, this is the defense that's coming. Most prosecutors don't know that. They had it handed to them. And 
first of all, is there any merit to what's in this proposal? And their, their conclusion was, no, there isn't. So let's just find a way to throw this out the window. It, it, everything backfired on them in the case. I mean, let's just, you know, run down the list. They bring in a coroner who's supposed to testify, Mr. Simpson did this with his knife. He testifies there are two knives used here. Again, it shatters the, the theory that they're putting forward. Uh, that's number one. Darden in the courtroom says, Mr. Simpson wore this glove when he killed these people, <laughs> so let's put the glove on him, right? They put the glove on him. The entire world can see that it doesn't even begin to fit his hands, <laughs> and it, it shatters that piece of evidence. The same exact thing happened here a little bit earlier. They were told that blood had been planted or manufactured evidence in this case, and they could have done a lot of different things to say, is it true? If it's true, what does it mean? I mean, in his five pages that he writes about this in his book, he says, this is Brady material. That's, that's in quotation marks, Brady material. That means if it's true, it's cause for a mistrial. It's, it's cause to essentially crack, you know, break down the prosecution's case. They didn't pursue it that way. They weren't interested in the truth. They were interested in shutting this thing down. And then once again, it backfired on them when it got into the courtroom. They were proven to be wrong. And instead of looking at it, pulling back and saying, what really happened here? How did this stuff get in that blood? And how did that blood get to Selmark where they were testing for the defendant's DNA? How did these things happen? What's the chain of events? That's called prosecutorial responsibility. They did exactly the opposite. Then they lose the case after a jury listens to nine months of evidence and walks a defendant out in three hours, probably the shortest deliberation in history for that kind of, you know, so-called mountain of evidence, which was not nothing resembling a mountain. And then my book came out, you know, the start of January, a month or so later, I got a phone call from Rockney Harmon. Rockney Harmon, again, is the lawyer for the prosecution who told the FBI, refute this theory. He called me up at home and began to chew me out for what, for my participation. So let's, let's think a little bit about what I'm saying. Not, you know, they were completely shut down by a government agency, the FBI, who ran an objectified, reasonable test to find out what really happened here. And then that proved to be not to their liking. Then they lose the case. And then they start calling up people like me and chewing me out. What <laughs> does it say? What does it say about the system here that, not the system, but the people who were absolutely determined to make this defendant fit this crime. They couldn't do it. The timeline was horribly problematical because you had people walking by the crime scene at 1030 or 1035 that night. And you have Simpson at his house 20, 25 minutes later, having gotten rid of all the evidence, cleaned up, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, no problem you have the blood evidence fall apart in front of them. You have the glove that doesn't fit. You have all the rest of it. And it's, again, I've said this before, Pierce, but you're, you're doing an excellent thing by giving people the opportunity to consider another point of view in this case. You, you can't imagine how difficult it's been to convey what I'm saying to you to convey to a larger media audience. It's just I've had some experience with it lately, and people are fundamentally resistant to what they don't know and haven't heard. That's, mm. That in itself is a very interesting philosophical discussion we may have one day. <laughs> but people use the word with me. Um, uh, someone recently said, that's a conspiracy theory. And I said, no, it's not a conspiracy, <laughs> and it's not a theory. This right. is this is the evidence in the case. I, I don't deal in conspiracy. This is evidence. Everything I'm saying about it is evidentiary, and that's the way the legal system works. Mm. It's a very long answer to your question, but I wanted to take the Chris Darden pages 
and and insert them into the new manuscript to show that, you know, at the most basic level, that I'm not making this story up for people, you know, that I was really there, that I really had this participation. And here's the one of the two lead prosecutors saying, not only did all this happen, but he comes to the end of the section and he says, I wondered how much O.J. Simpson paid for a defense strategy that came from a crime writer in Colorado. <laughs> right. So, so that, all, mentioning you, but, you know, all but name. <laughs> that's a pretty good endorsement. And so that again, to kind of finish that up, what's fascinating about that with Darden is that he, he devotes the time and the pages to it. He says it's Brady material, meaning it's exculpatory evidence, but he never follows through with the story I just told you. In other words, he never says the FBI was called in. He never says they found the substance in the blood. He never deals with the outcome of these events. He says, well, the, ju the jury was wrong. Simpson's <laughs> guilty, and that's that. Absolutely stunning that you could be in that position and be that closed-minded. Yeah, I, and, and that's across the board with everyone involved. It's almost as if the... The evidence that does come out in this trial is meaningless. It's like it didn't happen because no, no, because of course he was guilty. So all right. of this, the timeline not making sense, the EDTA, where are Nicole's phone records, you know, multiple knives, all yeah. this sort of stuff. None of that really means anything to to Darden or Furman or Marsha Clark and, you know, well, any of the people. And it goes far beyond that because... I probably have said this before, but the issue of my proposal came up in April in the courtroom in front of Judge Ito. Now, remember, it's written on November 1st, gets leaked. All of that happens with the FBI. And it, then it resurfaces in late April, which is, what, five, six months later. That was a big enough thing to, to, to go out to the media during the next few days. I was contacted by the 19 largest media organizations in the United States. That's everybody. That's network television, cable television, major newspapers, everybody. And I told them the story that I'm telling you. Now, remember, this is essentially May 1st of 1995. The trial is about three months old. It has about three or four or five months to go. I told them this is the story of the blood evidence this is going to factor into the trial, and it's going to play an important role. Five months later, four or five months later, Simpson is acquitted. There one reporter among any of those people that ever called back, that ever asked for the, you know, what really happened here? How did all this come about? What this evidence meant, how it played out with the jury, how they came out of that jury room for the last time and said, you know, it's, it's clear to us that evidence was manufactured. And I think they referred to some of the blood stuff. And it's just, it's absolutely stunning that, and of course, it's 20 years later and they haven't called, <laughs> they yeah. haven't called back yet. <laughs> right. But at some point, you know, what the hope is, is that young, maybe younger people, maybe people who aren't so invested in their own uh, you know, belief systems or thought processes that they actually have the capacity to hear something new. People like you, maybe you will have the curiosity to, to just go back and not say Steve is right or Steve is wrong, but what really happened? Mm -hmm. What truly happened during that trial? And one other point about it is that, you know, that jury was just called everything you could be called that's bad. It's extremely unfair to those people who sat there and listened to that evidence. They were the only people on earth who were commissioned to do that. They did it, and they had no trouble coming to that conclusion. They have been very, very badly mistreated by the press and many other people. So I'm standing up for those people because I think they did the right thing. Oh, and I'll just say that with the, the advent of the, the FX show, which uh, I, I uh, full disclosure, stopped watching because I just couldn't uh, bear with it anymore. But uh, I had a friend of mine recently who was uh, was talking about the FX show and was just, oh, my God, I mean, you know, it's so good. He's so guilty. And, again, it's it's that kind of thing 
where it's a it's a, it's fiction. They're taking you're taking a fictional show with all actors, and again, these are all big actors, so you know that that's not OJ. You know that's Cuba Gooding Jr. You know that's David Schwimmer. You and and again, and they're all sort of you know they're celebrities playing celebrities because all the people involved in this case are celebrities now, and they present you with this completely ridiculous false picture and of course i mean there was it was never going to be a fair portrayal of the trial when it's written or based on jeffrey tubin's book where he just you know flat out is oh he's 100 percent guilty it doesn't matter about the evidence um and, and unfortunately people are seeing that and kind of taking that away but at the same time Stephen, i think with it with your book now coming out and a very affordable price um, updated and you know just the response I've had from the podcast people are still interested in this trial and understanding it and it, it is as you say it, it's it's so important to the structure of you know the American legal system and just the society at large how much this case has sort of trickled down into our psyche where we where where we 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 have particular thoughts and opinions of things we know nothing about because of a brutal double homicide back in, in the mid nineties. And that has colored our perception on all sorts of, of, um, uh, be it trials or crimes or, or anything really. And, uh, that's what's so important. Yeah. uh, Obviously race relations and, you know, uh, anything like that, but getting back to, uh, getting back to your book, uh, uh, quickly. Um, I know uh, that you'd mentioned to me before that there were, um, sections of the uh, first edition of Legacy of Deception that the publisher uh, didn't want to put in there. And uh, a lot of, again, it, it, this is a, a theme in uh, all uh, research into the OJ trial. A lot of it has to do with drugs or any mention of uh, cocaine dealing or drug drug use. Um, are, are there any bits and pieces like that thrown in there in the book? Well, yeah. They, what I had explored was that, again, I'm a journalist, you know, I'm trying to deal in facts, in facts here, but the uh, many people don't know that Ron Goldman had a a friend acquaintance named Brett Cantor, who was on the nightclub scene in LA in the early nineties, summer of 93, he gets his throat slit from ear to ear, just like Goldman will one year later. And they, they had another acquaintance friend named Michael Nigg, who a year after Goldman, summer of 1995, he's in the parking lot of the Coyote restaurant in L.A., and somebody comes up, he's with his girlfriend, and shoots him to death. I would strongly suggest that, uh, you know, using a knife uh, might have looked a little too consistent of a pattern. So they, so I would just throw out the question, what are the odds of three young men, all the same age, all acquainted, all with some similar habits, nighttime stuff, uh, on the nighttime scene there, getting murdered in unsolved crimes? How many of us have heard of that one before? So the, the, the natural place to look in a case like this Let's say even if Simpson had been a suspect, let's say that glove is not found on that property at 6 a.m. on the morning of June 13, 1994. But let's say Simpson, because of some of his behavior in the past, which was not good and nobody here is defending it. It's very important to say that. Let's say he would have still been a suspect. They would have been forced as homicide investigators to look closely at both victims in this case and to see what trailed out from those victims. And in Nicole's case, it was very obvious. She was on the phone an hour or so before this with her friend Faye Resnick, who was in a, in a place called Exodus for people trying to dry out from cocaine. There were, there were restaurants on the west side where people were convicted, the west side of Los Angeles, where people were convicted because they were using the restaurants as cocaine distribution points. There were people in Florida that O.J. himself had had some contact with in Buffalo back in the 1970s. Three people were murdered in Florida a couple weeks after this crime. But we've never heard about that. We don't talk about that. So there are about seven or eight very violent deaths that fan out from this 
particular set of people. So whether you agree with what I'm saying or don't agree, it was the absolutely natural place to, to, to investigate when people are found with their throats cut by multiple knives, meaning multiple assailants, on, on, under those conditions. It never, ever happened. They, that stuff was never investigated. It was virtually laughed at in the courtroom. And so other people did a lot of research into this as well. I'm not taking credit for all of that. But I took some of that information and I fed it into the new version of the book and said, you know, why don't we look at this? You know, we don't have to draw a hard and fast conclusion, but wouldn't homicide detectives approaching a crime scene with anything resembling an open mind have looked at this and, and it never happened. And that's, that's one of the other, you know, tendrils of this tragedy because we don't know anything about it. Yeah, no, and uh, I think we spoke in our, our last uh, conversation on that, that particular idea that just in any other murder trial, any, any other criminal trial, it doesn't even have to be murder. Um, you would think that connections to, uh, you know, if, 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 if there's a crime and then suddenly you've got eight other people dying in a relatively short period of time, or all just connected. A- there were two other people who disappeared, so, yeah. Right, exactly. And, uh, you know, with a, a cursory glance of their background, you see that they're involved in something that's not on the up and up. Right. You would think that would warrant uh, a, a little bit of an investigation. But again, as you said, uh, Stephen, and, and this is a point I always try to make when I'm talking to people, is that once the glove was found, the case was o- the investigation was over. There yes. was no investigation of right. this murder. There was just the presumption that, well, of course, it was it was Simpson because, you know, the glove was found. Right. Um, and, and nothing else. I mean, uh, uh, I, I know we briefly talked and, about it uh, uh, last time, but there's also the, the Joey Ippolito, the, you know, uh, organized right. crime figure that uh, right. factors into all of this. And, and to go back to what I was talking about a little bit ago, it's why – the case in the courtroom was so tortured. It's why they were so committed to making evidence fit something where it simply didn't fit. The glove did not fit. The timeline did not work. The the blood evidence did not hold up. The knife evidence did not hold up. And and when I watched a little bit of the of the uh, some of the shows that came on around you know the FX program, I, that's what I thought watching things in the courtroom. It was so difficult for them to try to somehow fit Simpson into this scenario. And again, it's not it's it, if you look if you just line those things up, each one of them was knocked down. And the, the other thing about the FX show I just wanted to say is that I I only watched part of one episode. It, it's hard for me to watch, but. <laughs> It was all about the lawyers and the lawyers' lives and the lawyers arguing. And, you know, at the risk of sounding arrogant, that's not what this case was about. You know, it goes back to the original thing I said. This case is about evidence. And you look in that show, and I didn't watch much of it. I acknowledge that. But it has to be about the evidence. Lawyers arguing is is very tangential to many, many criminal trials. I've written books about a dozen high profile criminal cases and they play an important role. But that's not you know, it, it's interesting because Tubin's a lawyer. That's the perspective he writes from. Yes. Lawyers do. Lawyers take a point of view and they argue for it. They're advocates. That's what they do. Right, wrong, good, bad or ugly. They're advocates for a certain position. That's not what a journalist does. That is not the role of a journalist. And because journalism was all but trampled to death in this case, that's an important thing. You know, lawyers are there to argue and then to blame somebody else when they lose, like Rockney Harmon did with me. (laughs) I wasn't there to prove something. I was there to see if what I had originally been told in the case would play out to hold truth. And we've already talked about that. But if you go down the list of what those items were, they all checked out in the courtroom. Mm. I don't think there was 10 seconds devoted to that 
in the in the FX show. No, I mean that that and I think that's the whole point of the FX show is to show the trial as really a soap opera about Darden, Clark, Johnny Cochran, Carl Douglas, um Robert uh, uh, Shapiro and and Kardashian, you know that's really what the show is about. It is is again turning these lo- celebrity lawyers into even bigger celebrity lawyers and having the focus be on their personal struggle, as if that means anything. And right. you know, right. it, it, it's uh, who cares? Right. Who cares? I mean, yes, it it it. I, I'm not trying to dismiss the fact like uh, the press was. <laughs> probably a bit unfair to Marsha Clark. Um, there's obviously, you know, it was, Oh, look at her hair is changed. She's wearing, you know, this kind of outfit and blah, blah, blah. And she obviously had her own personal life. That was a, a very, uh, upsetting at the time fighting with her, um, her, uh, her, her former husband and who's a Scientologist and trying to get their kids back, but whatever that who cares really about that. You know, when you're trying to convict a man who is innocent, that's, you know, it doesn't really matter. But again, the show is sort of twisting your emotions where, you know, whereby because Marsha Clark is being picked on and it's really tough for her, we should sympathize with her. And then that means OJ is guilty. Well, that's not really how the criminal justice system is supposed to work. But no. that is very much the, again, this melding between reality and Hollywood, you know, reality and fiction. And of course the OJ trial is just full of that, you know, it's right there in the, you know, Brentwood in the center of the land of illusions. Right. You know, we, we tend to, we, we sympathize with some of these people at the, the the risk of basically throwing away our constitutional rights and whatnot. Uh, And it, it, it's, it's, it's wild that that's still happening. But again, as I said, I think with, with this new edition of your book, I think we're going to, you know, a lot more people are out there are going to start to peel this back a little bit. And again, I mean, once you start looking at the evidence, it's, it's not, it's not like you're going to look at the evidence and, and still come away. Well, I don't know. I think he's still guilty. Um, you're going to look at the evidence and, and suddenly you're going to ask yourself, well, who did do this? Right. Um, because those, the, these person people are still out there. They got right. away with. It. I mean, they they truly got away with murder. I mean, who are they? Why right. did this happen? Um, you know, why why to this day are uh, you know like the the Goldman family is is still. Uh, I mean, they they every time every chance they get, they're they're harping on about this case. And obviously, yes, they lost a son. But I mean, I'm speculating here. They have to know that there was something else. You know, that it wasn't just OJ. Well, you know, I, 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 I can't, I can't speak to that, but I, 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 you know, people do deserve sympathy. I, I'm, I'm very much with that. I, Chris Darden was put in a tough position as Mm -hmm. a black man trying to prosecute a very famous black man. You know, I understand that people have personal problems and, and you have to feel for the Goldman's because they lost their son. Yeah. But it, you know, we've had 20 years of that. That, was tw- that 20 years has gotten us absolutely nowhere, you know, except deeper racial divides, more, you know, non-understanding around this case. If what, what I would say to anybody out there is, you know, who's interested at all in this story, I mean, get, just give it a chance. You know, like Pierce said, the book is out there on Amazon, Legacy of Deception. It's on Kindle. It's on Smashwords. And it it tells you a story you have never, ever heard before. And you have the lead prosecutor in the case saying, this is where the Simpson defense came from. It, it came from these ideas. That's a pretty big statement for somebody to make. And that story has effectively, you know, been suppressed or repressed for 20 some years. And Pierce is, is brought it out of the woodwork here. He's performing a great public service for everyone who's out there. And he's giving something else the chance to breathe. We do ourselves no good by, by absolutely refusing to consider new ideas or, or, or think that we know everything about something this complicated. 
all I'm asking for is, is some curiosity. You, you can read it and ultimately say, I don't agree with the guy. That's fine. But you don't really have access to this information because the major media wouldn't deal with it. Hollywood wouldn't deal with it. The legal system, for the most part, wouldn't deal with it. And that attitude is absolutely lethal and toxic. And that's why we have, you know, some of the racial division we have. That's why this whole Black Lives Matter movement it sort of came from this. You know, this stuff is ongoing. Yesterday, the, the police officer in Baltimore was acquitted in the death of Freddie Gray. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking an opinion on that, but I'm saying... This was a huge, huge American event about crime and race. And, you know, with all due respect, Marsha Clark's hair doesn't really stack up to that. And <laughs> no. We, 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 have the, we have the right, you know, we have the, the, the privilege in a free society to, to explore the information that's available to us. And I would encourage people to do that. Yeah, exactly. And I, I just uh, reiterate that again, you don't have to be afraid to question this. You know, that, right. that's the biggest thing, especially with the OJ trial, um, is that it's, it's, you bring that up and it, it's, it's, it's almost like one of those sort of like deal breakers, like in a relationship, you know, if, if two people meet at a bar and it's, well, well, what's your stance on OJ? Oh, if you have a particular yeah. view, forget it. We're not talking anymore. You, you, we shouldn't be afraid, especially as you said, yeah. Stephen, this is 20 years on. You know, it, it's time. I think enough time has passed where we can look at this objectively and we can question our own ideas and opinions. And again, most of this are most of these are really opinions. Most, you know, people aren't coming at this with, oh, well, but here's the evidence proving that he did it because there yeah. really isn't. And and I guess what you have to understand is that, you know, I, I was came into this case in the first week of August of 1994. I'm not, so I'm not, you know, and, and the six weeks prior to that, from the crime on June 12th to August 2nd, I thought he was guilty too. I mean, <laughs> I, I looked at what was on television. I watched the Bronco ride. I watched the whole thing. I mean, what, what other conclusion could you draw? So much of the book that I've written is about my own self-education about how easily I could be manipulated and anybody can be manipulated into thinking or feeling anything because the only thing you're interacting with are those images on television in addition to one talking head after another saying the same thing over and over again. He's guilty, he's guilty, he's guilty. Why well, I, I had, you know, shallowly, superficially reached the same conclusion and I was told when I was given the initial information, you know, this is going to be good for you because you're going to get a real education. And that's, you know, that's really the larger point of the story. If you sort of set OJ aside and all the rest of it, how easily can we be manipulated by a handful of images and words? That's my educational process in writing the book. And I was, as, you know, guilty of it as anybody else. Mm. Yeah, and again, and, uh, as you say, I mean, if you can be manipulated um, with a case like this, you really can be manipulated into believing almost anything. Um, right. I think as we've, you know, as evidenced by any number of uh, events that have happened here and abroad, uh, where we were instantly told this is the story and you better go with it. And if you question it, you're a Looney Tune and, you know, we're not going right. to give you the time of day. But anyway, Stephen, I think we're going to leave it there for now. Um, as I said again, I'm so happy um, that, that this new edition is coming out. Um, quickly, you can, of course, find it on Amazon.com and I'll put a link up to that in the show notes. If you if you enjoy this book, then please, um, you know, write a review that that definitely helps, um, you know, with, uh, you know, statistics on Amazon and more people will see it the more you review. I myself have to uh, put up a review because I have not already. Um, and Stephen, are there any other places uh, where people can go to find the book? Smashwords. It's it's. It's that's another you know ebook uh, platform. Excellent. And, and uh, and Kindle, Amazon oh, Kindle. Excellent. And we we will of course put up uh, both of those uh, in the show notes. And uh, and just to uh, quickly say while while we're on the the topic of books, 
Uh, it is almost the 20th anniversary of the John Bonet Ramsey murder. And uh, Stephen also mm-hmm. wrote a very interesting book called Presumed Guilty, an investigation into the John Bonet Ramsey case, the media and the culture of pornography. And uh, hopefully, uh, as we get closer to the 20th anniversary of this uh, uh, brutal murder, we will have Stephen on again to talk about that book as well. Thank you, Pierce, for bringing up the Ramsey book. That book is also going into electronic form and will be put up as an ebook later in the year. Oh, with, excellent. With, and it will be revised and expanded as well. Oh, excellent. Oh, we'll, we will definitely have you on then to uh, discuss Presumed Guilty. I'm so glad, Stephen, that you're updating your books and you're getting them out there because I think there's a, a whole new generation of people my age that are discovering your work and it's just fantastic. Yes. So thank Great. you so much for joining us again. Thank, thank you. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you so much for listening to this special bonus podcast on Porkins Policy Radio. As I said at the beginning of this, this is all part of my Patreon campaign. And I really do hope that uh, all of you out there who love the show and who enjoy the work and get a lot out of what I do will come and help support. As I said, you can support me for as little as a dollar a month or three or five dollars a month. And uh, just again, the uh, five dollar a month bonus podcast will be uh, different every single time. As I said at the beginning of this, sometimes they will be interviews, sometimes they will be in-depth podcasts on uh, a variety of topics, but I will also be doing a lot more personal podcasts, uh, talking about myself, talking about my uh, outside interests, aside from, um, you know, uh, deep state politics and conspiracy theories and whatnot. So I hope that you will all uh, get a kick out of those. And again, if you want to send in some questions, uh, you know, if you want to send in some topic ideas that we can cover in the bonus podcast, that is, of course, welcomed. And again, if you want to just give me a one-time donation, then please just click on the donate button. Uh, and that will sh- bring you straight uh, to PayPal, and you can give me a one-time donation. Well, thank you all so much for listening. Uh, I should also uh, make a quick note that the exclusive bonus podcast will, of course, only be available to those that subscribe on Patreon. Uh, this one, of course, was free for everybody because um, Stephen Singular's uh, new edition of Legacy of Deception is something that everyone should go out and uh, get a copy of and listen to. But uh, this is just, again, as I said, a little tease for everybody, and I hope that they will donate to Patreon. Well, thank you all so much, and I will be talking to you very soon.